Chris, what's up? Boom, Nicole. We are here. We haven't done this room in so long, and I keep getting requests for it. It's insane. Well, this is going to be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, Clubhouse, what's up? My name is Nicole Benham. I'm the founder of Beyond Media. You can find us on Instagram at Beyond the Interview. And tonight, we are celebrating the five-year anniversary of the best-selling book, Never Split the Difference, by former FBI hostage negotiator and founder of the Black Swan Group, Chris Voss. I love the book Never Split the Difference because it really takes you inside the world of high stakes negotiations and into Chris's world where he dealt with bank robbers, kidnappers, and all sorts of criminals. I've personally read the book many times and in it, Chris shares so many counterintuitive tactics and strategies that anyone can use to become more persuasive in their professional but also their personal lives. Like, like Chris says in his master class, life really is a series of negotiations. Buying a car, negotiating a salary, buying a home, renegotiating rent, uh, deliberating with your partners. Literally so many life experiences that we all face involve negotiation. But learning this stuff just helps you become a better communicator in general. Um, you guys know I'm also very passionate about mental health, and I believe part of feeling mentally healthy is feeling that you have agency in your own life, which this book also helps with. Um, Chris, you ready? I am ready to go, and I and I also want to say up front, I want to remind everybody they should follow you on Instagram and beyond the interview because you are pushing out a tremendous amount of information that helps people and your heart is in the right place. It's about making people have better better and happier lives. Thank you, Chris. Um, really quickly, I, I also just want to shout out Ronan, who always helps with these rooms. He is such a brilliant creative, and I like to call him the intersection because he's such a pro at collecting and understanding diverse sets of information and combining them in interesting ways. Ronan, you add so much uh, dimension to conversations with your thought-provoking insights, and I'm so grateful that you're here with us. Thank you, Ro. Wow, thanks. Just introduce me to everyone from now on. I feel I like will. Every I know. goal in life <laughs> should just be for Nicole to introduce you anywhere to anyone. I will. Oh my Wait. God, it's so and and let me do let me do Stephanie really quickly. Uh, Stephanie, oh, no. no, Steph, let me just do it. It feels good. Trust me, it's a it's a dopamine hit. Um, Stephanie is an amazing woman, a beautiful woman, and the head of community and content at Clubhouse. She helps us with with our rooms, and she helps us all the time. Um, she's great to go to with questions, and she's really a big part of Clubhouse, um, and we're so grateful for her. Stephanie, thank you so much for being here. Thank there we you, go. Nicole. Thanks for the <laughs> dopamine hit. Preach. There, there we go. I'm telling you, it feels good. Um, but yeah, I want to get right into it. Uh, Chris, something that, that you always say is, if you find yourself arguing or explaining, you're losing. Uh, what does arguing and explaining look like, and what is it ab about that that makes us lose? Yeah, well, um, ex it feels like explaining to us and to the person on the other end, it's arguing. And, you know, regardless of your politics, Ronald Reagan said a long time ago, if you're explaining, you're losing. I mean, you know, explaining has this overtone that, you know, I'm smarter than you. I've got insights that you don't have. And even if it's right, it just doesn't feel good to the other side. It's not collaborative. It's it's at people versus with people. And then it becomes a zero-sum game. And with people is a positive-sum game. I mean, you, you discover stuff with people. Um, the other person always knows something you don't know and always has insights which could make you better if you just give them a chance to share it with you. So, yeah, if you're explaining, you're losing. All right. That's so helpful, um, especially these days. We see so so many of these conversations um, on social media, and, and that is so helpful. And I want to talk about tone for a second. How How should we pay attention to our tone, and how important is it when we're communicating? You know, well, the cool thing about all these skills is that as soon as you start paying attention to them for yourself, you feel better. 
and the other person feels better too. I mean, you know, I've always implemented this tactically to calm the other side down, make the other side feel better. But it works for me too. And even, you know, the infamous late night FM DJ voice. Like when I use that, it smooths me out too. I mean, there, there have been a couple of times recently that, uh, you know, I, I think, I think a fair amount of people know that, yeah, my mother died just before Easter. And I can remember getting very emotional in that time period. Also, you know, at her funeral and just to gain control of my own emotions, I would intentionally move over into that downward inflecting calming, soothing voice. And, and I found that it helped me get a grasp on my own emotions to keep from going down the tubes in any particular negative fashion. So as much as this does for the other people that you interact with, and it does a lot for them, uh, it does more for you too. So, you know, it's uh, the, their benefit is almost the, the fringe benefit. It, it helps you level out and it helps you keep on a, on a more even keel. Empathy versus tactical empathy. What is tactical empathy and what what are the misconceptions about what empathy is and then your definition of it? All right. So I won't, I won't be Al Gore here. I mean, <laughs> what do I mean by that? You know, at a summit event, you know, and, and Stephanie and I were just t- talking about uh, summit events. You know, Al Gore was being interviewed by uh, Jaden Smith, Will Smith's son. And, uh, you know, everybody was there. They wanted, they wanted to hear what was going on, what Al had to say, how, how Jaden was going to interview him. And, and, you know, Jaden asked him a relatively innocent question about the Internet. And Al said, and seriously, he says, well, with the invention of the printing press, and I thought, oh, God, how long is this answer going to take? We're going to be here for an hour and a half and everybody's going to fall asleep. But empathy was originally designed, it's an interpretation of a German word about art, trying to understand where an artist is coming from, trying to understand the feelings that the artist was trying to demonstrate with the expression of the art. You know, you don't get, you're not getting personally attached to the art, but it's Understanding where feelings are coming from. Empathy is a transmission of inf- information. Sympathy is a reaction to that information. That's a paraphrase of an author that I think a lot of, Stephen Kotler. Those of you, most people probably read The Rise of Superman or Stealing Fire. And he's very much in empathy. As a side note for people that are trying to solve the world's problems, Stephen and I both believe that empathy is a sneak attack on racism which is an interesting way to attack some of the problems in today's society. But it's not sympathy. It's not. But it is demonstrating an understanding of where somebody's coming from. Being able to say, like I used to say to Muslim witnesses, you believe that there's been a succession of United States governments for the last 200 years that have been anti-Islamic. And you could just see the, the change. Instantly, you know, they were fascinated by me. You know, is this is this Caucasian American representative of an imperialist government demonstrating understanding? And I would win their trust as a result. I never said it was true. I never said I agreed, which they also understood. They understood that I was simply respecting their perspective and they knew that I never actually agreed, but they wanted the respect. So that's all empathy is, you know, showing that you definitely understand where the other side is coming from. And an Israeli could say to a Palestinian, you know, when the state of Israel was created as a result of World War II, it got dumped on your head as a result of the conflicts in the Arab world. And that's a demonstration of understanding of both sides, not, not pointing out any really fingers like you're horrible. You did this. You hurt us this way. You know, it's a demonstration of understanding. It isn't any more complicated than that. And people can maintain their own integrity. Now, we dropped the word tactical in when we began learning about neuroscience and found out that neuroscience backed up everything that we were doing as hostage negotiators, not because the bad guys were terrorists, but because they were humans. That's beautiful. Um, how how open would you be to to... I guess, mediating, moderating a conversation between an Israeli and a Palestinian on this stage, Chris. Yeah, I'd do it. I'd do it. You know, they, they, 
we, you know, we'd need a, a, uh, both a no interruption rule and a no talking for 60 minutes rule. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Um, I'm going to ask a few more questions and then um, and then I would like if we have, uh, you know, one person from from one side, someone from the other, uh, you know, another perspective. Um, I would love that. And also, I would like to welcome Nate Jones to the stage, who's incredible. He's from Andreessen Horowitz, and he's an investor in, I think, culture startups. Uh, Nate, love what you're doing. It's super cool. I've been hearing about it so much. Um, you know, you're building cultural breakthroughs and consumer products and services. And, you know, I'm sure you deal with negotiations all the time. So we're so grateful to have you, Nate. Oh, thanks for having me. I actually help other people deal with their negotiations as they're raising their rounds. But yeah, absolutely. And any room Chris is in, man, I, I just want to soak up all the knowledge. So, you know, I appreciate it so much just being in here, Chris. Uh, you're always you're always dropping gems every time. So, Nicole, thanks for having me. And, and of course, everybody on the stage, this is all my friends on stage. So what's up, Wolf, Stephanie, Farouk, Ronan, what's good? So oh, yeah, this is, this is dope. Farouk and Wolf, uh, one of the trusted names uh, on this app, Farouk hosts some of the best NFT rooms and, you know, all the celebrities and Wolf, same. You guys are incredible. I'm so grateful to have you guys here as well. Um, and feel free to chime in at any point, uh, any of you. And next question I want to get to is, um, Chris, you talk about intuition a lot when it comes to negotiation. And you've also said women have stronger intuition. How do you define intuition? When did you notice that women have stronger intuition and how can we strengthen our intuition? Um, first of all, I think, I think women, let's get away from the nature nurture stuff because you know, it's hard to define what we were actually born with. And then it kind of doesn't matter depending upon how we're raised. But n women are nurtured to be recognized soft skills much earlier in life because there's a recognition that physically generally women being physically weaker they have to start relying on their brain much sooner you know little boys you know they teach them to scrap they teach them to fight um you know i, I try to raise my son differently and, and you know he's a monster negotiator but you know the, the in general in general little girls are taught to start being using their brains and their emotional intelligence much sooner than little boys are. So they kind of, they got a head start. I mean, Daniel Coyle's book, The Count Talent Code, contends that everything is learned. And the sooner you get a head start, the sooner you get good at it. So that's why I think that women have a tendency to pick up emotional intelligence based negotiation faster than men do. They get, you know, they got a head start on it. And it feels more natural to them that, you know, there's another reason I think you tend to model what you see in the environment than. There are far more many men modeling bad negotiation than there are women modeling bad negotiation. So there are more bad role models for, for, for men and women in getting ahead and in pushing our society forward. You know, they're, they're sort of feeling their way with fewer mo role models. So I think they're as a, as a, as a gender are more open to learning faster because of that, because there aren't as many bad role models for them, and, and they instinctively feel, you know, the advice to be one of the guys, that's really tough advice, and it has to instinctively on some level feel wrong. It's very hard to be emulate the gender that you are not. So that makes sense. Now, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I, I was just going to say that makes so much sense, but, but go on. I, I, I felt a pause, so I thought you were done, but I would love to hear the rest of it. <laughs> okay. So intuition, intuition is just recognition of that, you know, trying to tap into our emotional intelligence. You know, there are two things that I think contribute to intuition, which maybe help illuminate it. You know, first of all, um, Bruce Lipton, I think, wrote the biology of belief. Uh, the stat that I got that I'm going to quote roughly here is that your conscious mind processes roughly 40 bits of information per second and your subconscious processes 20 million 
you know, that's a 500,000 to one ratio. So everybody's been born with the supercomputer between their ears, this subconscious mind, processing massive amounts of information in a, you know, in the blink of an eye, which kicks out data to us that we don't fully understand. An example of that in, in Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, he talks about a fire crew being in a house. And they were standing in the kitchen and they couldn't really locate where the fire was. Uh, You know, they're responding to an alarm and they feel a certain amount of heat. But all of a sudden, a fire chief starts screaming, out, 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 everybody out, everybody out. And as soon as everybody gets out, the kitchen that they were in explodes in flames and a floor collapses. And they said, you know, wow, you got this great sixth sense. You got this great instinct. And he thought about it. And. What triggered his intuition, his supercomputer processing, their bodies are covered with gear except their ears. And he felt intense heat on his ears, but he didn't see the flames. And his brain calculated the difference in the data. And his brain told him, we have to be completely surrounded with fire. We just can't see it yet. Everybody out. So intuition is just recognition of your brain's supercomputer ability to process data, and it can kick it out, and you can do incredible things once you start listening to it. I hope everybody's taking notes right now, because this is so, this is the information that we need. Um that was brilliantly said. Does anyone on this stage have a follow-up question for that? Um, because I have a couple more and then, um, and then maybe we could get, we could get two people to talk about the conflict with Chris as the moderator. I have a follow-up. How do you practice and train your intuition? And you've talked about this a little bit, but I'm curious your thoughts on that. Yeah. You know, um, Small stakes negotiation, you know, uh, there's a technical term that we like to use in a black swan method. Uh, It's called swag, which is a scientific wild ass (laughs) guess. So like in, you know, in the conversations, you know, where you have got a lot at stake, you know, take, take a scientific, take a swag of what the other person is feeling. Now, every time you do that, you're going to get data back and your intuition is going to get better the cashier take a swag on how they're feeling in the moment the mere fact that you took a guess on how they're feeling first of all might be the first moment in the day that somebody actually looked at them and noticed them as a human being and even like cares what they're feeling like even guessing what someone's feeling even if you're wrong is like a nice act that at least someone cares about your feelings and it gives you a chance to say what you're actually feeling. So it's very low risk. That's right. And you know how valuable it is when you get somebody to say that's right, don't you? <laughs> yeah, so you, well, you know, you're, you're practicing your negotiation and you're making the world a better place at the same time. That's not a bad double benefit. So a lot of failed negotiations fail because of assumptions made about the logical yeah. motivators, the lot of logical motivation of the person on the other side. Why is that? Why isn't it always the logical reason for negotiating that causes negotiations to fail? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, first of all, logic's a tough word. Um, You know, your logic flows from what you think is important and what you think is important is based on what you care about and all kind of tracks back to emotion. Reason one. Well, can I I clarify real quick? The stated reason that someone comes into a negotiation and then when it breaks down, the reason that they end up stating after it breaks down being completely different than what they stated when they came in. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, I mean, first of all, I'm going to take a wild guess as as to why it's breaking down because... My my swag on it is um, I'll either get it right, which you'll like, or you'll correct me. Now, getting corrected is one of the negotiation superpowers. It is insane once you start getting intentionally corrected. Now, why don't if it works so good, why don't most people do it? 
because most people are scared to be wrong. They're embarrassed. You know, it, it's a cliche die of embarrassment. You, you know, you'd rather, you'd rather have your head cut off than be embarrassed in front of somebody else. But what happens when somebody else corrects us? They're helping us. They're stepping to our side. So instead of me asking you, um, you know, why the negotiation break, broke down. Plus, I probably, uh, not knowing any better, I would use the word why, which is a really bad idea in that context. Why is, why is a surgical emotional intelligence guided missile, which will go off in the wrong place if you don't know what you're shooting at? People are ridiculously honest when they're correcting. Give you an example. We're coaching. Uh, we, we did training for a construction company out of England. And they've got a they've got a project they're working on that's breaking down, and they got a they got a wild guess as to roughly who the executive that's a problem is on the other side. Now most people could say, you know, what's the problem? They could ask. You know, we're trained to ask, which is actually a low percentage way of finding out. But instead, let's give the two fictional executives on the other side names: Tom and Bob. The negotiator we're coaching says it seems like both Tom and Bob are against this deal. And the person on the other side immediately shoots back, no, it's not Tom, it's Bob. Now, he never should have given that information up because he just immediately threw one of their guys under the bus. But the urge to correct is overwhelming. It's so satisfying to correct. Like if you correct three people, you probably want to go smoke a cigarette afterwards. Is that satisfying? <laughs> So use it as a superpower. I'm not going to ask you why it broke down. I'm going to guess. And if I get it wrong, correcting me will be very satisfying for me, for you. You will do it. And I can probably count on it being really true. All right. Well, just more knowledge bombs left and right with you, Chris. Uh, this is really my favorite room. And there's, you know, it's very clear why it's so popular. Um the uh, the question I wanted to ask before we brought people onto the stage um, was uh, I got an interesting question on the Beyond the Interview page where I posted um, a lot of the stuff that you tweet, which is super helpful. Uh, and I think I've heard you address this before because, you know, some people assume some of these tactics are manipulative. And somebody asked, is it true empathy if you're showcasing it just to get the result you want from that person. So what do you have to say uh, to that question? Yeah, uh, guilt, uh, my first answer is going to be guilty as charged. I, what we teach, um, a good negotiation skill works for mercenaries and for missionaries. Mercenary is I choose it because it works, period. It's effective. It works. Now, if I'm using it for good or evil, it depends upon whether or not I got a missionary side. You know, I also use empathy because it makes the other side feel better on so many levels. It's better for my long-term relationships. Um, and if a negotiation skill satisfies the mercenaries and the missionaries, then that's a good skill. It could be a missionary skill and not do you any good. It could be ineffective. It's got to be effective. The, the tools aren't evil in and of themselves. It's, it's how they're used. Um, I got a sharp, I got a scalpel. I can use it to remove cancer from your body or a doctor could use it to remove cancer from your body and save your life. A scalpel in somebody else's hands, they can cut your throat. So the scalpel's not evil. It's how it's used. And if you're using your negotiation skills for bad intent, and some people do, you're going to pay for it. And human nature being what it is, when people pay you back, they're not satisfied until they pay you back at two to three times what you cost them. And long term, that's a bad idea. So, you know, I don't want people spoiling to pay me back. I want people talking about how dealing with me helped them move their life forward. Yes, that is so beautiful and well said. Thank you, Chris. Um, I want to get into... Or I, I, got, I got something I, I want to interject for at some point. In oh, time, no, go ahead. I get a lot of questions. I've always not a lot, you know, but there's always questions from guys. Can we use labels and mirrors and tactical empathy in dating in our personal and our social lives? 
And I'm hearing this rumor lately that more women are using it in their personal lives with men in order to gain the upper hand. And I don't know if there's anybody that could speak to that, but I'm, I, I'm sure there is some. There's a woman in the audience who I had dinner with tonight who was asking for advice along these lines with the guy who she's dating. And after dinner, I just sent her the link because this is exactly what she's looking for to apply it in that situation. All right. Very good. Chris, I have something to say. <clears throat> Sorry, I just sound like I smoked a pack of 12 cigarettes. Um, <laughs> I uh, recently, being that we met in real life, I was like, I actually need to read his book. And I was texting Nicole that I was taking notes and I wish I had read this book a long time ago, but <laughs> I kind of was like, I want to see how this would affect me in relationships. And recently there was a couple of dates that I went on with men and nothing really bad happened, but it kind of fizzled out. So, or maybe they weren't being assertive enough or they would make plans or they would get busy or they would cancel. So there was one point in your book where you talked about sending out an email and it wasn't, it wasn't rude. It was just direct, but you would gain an emotional response from the person. And I believe, uh, the email said, um, have you given up on this project? <laughs> so I told Nicole, I'm going to try this. So what I did was I catered it to some of the men that I, I would have loved to went on another date with. So I said, Hey, have you, have you given up on wanting to get to know me? And the strangest thing happened is every single one of those men responded to me and they started telling me how they felt. And I, I would say back to them, I'm sorry, you were really busy. And I would try to get them on the phone because I think talking on the phone is better, but I slowed down my tone of voice and I just kind of presented it back to them and it worked. And guess what? I have two dates next week. So I'm trying to use it for the good, but Chris, you're getting me more dates on the book. So thank you. Congratulations. You're using your powers for good and not evil. <laughs> Thank you. This is exactly what I'm talking about. You know, you think you're reading a book on business negotiation because that's the category that it's in, but you're really learning how to communicate and how how to get life to go your way. And that's something we all want. And like I said before, it gives you a sense of agency and control and that makes you feel good and it's good for your mental health. So Chris, I love that you brought that up. And Brianne, I, I love that you're actually using this in your dating life. It makes me so happy and, and honestly motivates me to do it as well. I was telling um, Leah Lamar, who's on the stage with us, when I saw her Saturday that, that you were doing some of this stuff and she's like, wait, I need to learn. We all need to learn. Uh, also, welcome Rembrandt and Leah to the stage. So grateful to have you. Um, I wanted to get into... This is a hard one, even for me. Um, the Israel-Palestine conflict, and I know, you know, nobody, nobody that I know who's, you know, a humane wants any uh, civilian casualties or wants anything bad to happen to anyone on either side. But it's it's such a tough um, conflict, and it's so hard to have conversations about it because we all believe that we're right, and we all have opinions based on the news outlets and the political commentators that we listen to and they're all so different but um i'm gonna turn off hand raising for one second and then i'm gonna turn it back on um, and if anyone who stands with israel and is willing to speak um, would be willing to come on the stage to have chris uh help moderate a conversation between someone who stands with palestine I would love if you could raise your hand if you stand with Israel and you feel comfortable speaking about this. Okay, amazing. All right, so we got our person. Uh, I'm gonna turn it off. I'm gonna turn hand raising off. And then I invite someone who, sta uh, who stands with uh, Palestine to come to the stage. Raise your hand if you feel comfortable 
talking about this from a from a civil educated perspective um all right let me see hey maria hey shane how are you good thanks for having me good thank you of course chris are you so, ready yeah i i am ready i'm looking forward to to, to getting into this and you know we're, we're gonna we're gonna start with the ground rules i mean the ground rules are that when whichever one of you goes first, it doesn't make any difference. We'll, Shane, Shane will go first, but Shane will go before I put forth my position. I want to make sure I have your feelings on this correct. And this is this is we're going to take seek, seek first to understand, then be understood to the next level. It's seek first to demonstrate understanding. And when the other person acknowledges to you that you've got their position right, you're then clear to put forth your own. It's the equivalent of getting a that's right with no more corrections, no more additions, no more guidance from the other side. And that's the only rule. You got the other side has to feel heard before we continue. That's all we ask. You don't have to agree, but you can't disagree just have to make sure that the other side feels heard. This will not compromise your position or take away your ability to offer your own thoughts. We're just going to do a sequence. Shane, Shane, does that sound ridiculous to you? No, no, it sounds very fair to me, Chris. Maria, are you against proceeding under those rules? I have no problems with it. All right. Um, Maria, uh, you know your your name starts first in the alphabet. That's that that's the rule <laughs> that'll go with her. M M is for Maria. They call okay. the win Maria. Uh, anyway, no, go ahead. Okay. What if pro Israel? Someone who's pro Israel. Someone who's going to defend Israel's position in this. Uh, you're taking a swag on how Shane would start, and I before he even speaks, I want you to to do your best to summarize what you suspect his position would be. What would he say? Um, I'm pro-Israel or I was speaking on behalf of the Palestinians. Yes, I mean, I exactly. I know. I know. You've got to demonstrate an understanding of the pro-Israel position before you speak on behalf of the Palestinians. Well, um, Netanyahu, and I have watched this whole process for a long time, you know, between the Israelis, um, when, you know, what's his name, Sh Shimon, or whatever his name was, that was in, in charge before he died. And I have never really understood the whole conflict, even though I've on, read about hold it. On, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. So you're unaware that the Israelis feel like they never had their own state before, their own country. You're unaware of that? No, 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 I am aware of that. I'm well okay. aware of that. Okay, all right. So but, that's, that's the ground rules. Okay. Seek first to demonstrate understanding of the other side's position before you can put forth yours. Now, here's gotcha. a real tough distinction mm -hmm. for people. Understanding is not agreement. Now, most people want to say, well, when you say I never understood their position – you're making mm -hmm. understand and agreement synonymous. And mm -hmm. we're going to decouple those words so that you can okay. understand while never agreeing. Okay. Okay. Can I speak? I'm ready. Let's go. <laughs> okay. So based on my understanding of what I, I am a healthcare worker. Okay, wait, and first, wait, and, first and wait, foremost, wait, 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 wait. You're breaking the rules. You're you're you're, you're making me I'm crawl into through. a fetal position. I'm gonna suck okay, my thumb right, and cry. Okay, all right, all right. Okay, okay, okay. Don't cry. Okay, all right. Listen, all I wanted to say, okay, that you've given me the opportunity. All I want to say is this. All right, whatever is going on between this has been Hold going on. This on. has been longstanding. Oh, Maria, Maria. Mm -hmm. now, okay. You're, 
we're, this is how hard this is to do for the first time, especially okay. on an emotional issue, because we're just not wired to demonstrate the <laughs> understanding even... of what's what our opposition is thinking. So mm -hmm. if you can't do it, how do we want our leaders to do it? <sighs> I don't All right, know. let me ask you I... a couple questions. I'm not Palestinian. Uh, Are uh -huh. you Palestinian? No. Okay. So do you know what the Nakba is? Not, no, I don't. It's a catastrophe. Right. It's a Palestinian word for catastrophe. Okay. So many people, so many Palestinians lost their home that they're still carrying the keys to the house that they lost as a result of the war in their pocket right. with the hopes of returning one day. Mm -hmm. Enlightened Palestinians that I know will say, we knew that Israel got thrown off a building while the rest of the world watched. The problem is they landed on us. Mm -hmm. The problem is that our Arab neighbors have placed us in the center of this controversy when we're the ones that lost our homes we want to exist as much as anybody else does on the planet and right. we've been lost in the shuffle i'm not even palestinian and i know that okay because that's about Listen. demonstrating the maria okay we had Good. some rules we had some rules. go ahead I'm listening. Go ahead. Well, I want you to Sean show, speak now? demonstrate an understanding. Okay. For what's Sean's position? What would Sean say is his position? Let Sean go ahead and speak. Shane. <laughs> Shane. All right. I, my, my, my problem. All right, Maria. We're going to. Now, yeah. if we let Sean, if we let Shane speak, please come back, Shane. Shane. Yes, sir. You've got to demonstrate an understanding for the Palestinian position. Yeah. Um, well, I think um, Palestinians feel oppressed and, and are oppressed, and they're, they're oppressed by their government. They're oppressed by Israelis, and I, I think they feel like resistance is, is the is the only path. And um, I think um, it, it's a very tough plight that they're in. And I um, I want I want nothing more than peace in that land. And my, my heart goes out to those people who repeatedly get the short end of the stick, no matter what the situation is. And and what the cause is, I think they are always the one who gets it the worst. Um, I don't know if I articulated that in, in the way you were kind of looking for, but I, um, yeah, that's that's what I would say. That you know, that's a good start. That's a really good start, and that would stimulate some dialogue because what you would get from the other side was when you're close, they're going to start throwing at you the stuff that you left out that you're afraid to say and that's where you really get started like when i was i'm talking to a i'm talking to a sunni muslim from egypt and i'm saying you believe that the american colonial oppressor has had their foot on your throat for 200 years so i mean I, I, I said, you believe. That's not saying that I agree, but I'm showing a fearlessness in the other side's perspective. There's going to be two things that they're going to they're going to talk about. You stuck to the 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 safer stuff for you to talk about, which is a great way to start. But if you really want to dig into the conversation, you would say not that they've been oppressed. You would say. You feel that Israel is the oppressor, that Israel, you feel Israel is denying your right to exist. You feel that the Israeli government is stealing land against the agreements. You feel, and again, this is hard, and this is why, and stuff we're really emotional about, that's a tough place to start. Demonstrating an understanding of the other side's perspective really starts with the Lyft driver, the grocery store cashier, the Starbucks clerk, because no, this is a human performance skill. 
And no champion ever started using this skill in the championship event. They always started on a practice field where they're trying to get used to it. They're trying to learn it. And in relationships where they just want to learn, because when you start getting into emotional issues, the neurosynaptic connections that you rely on take over. I could get into my knowledge of neuroscience, which is enough to make somebody like Andrew Huberman uh, uh, probably make his head explode. I'm a huge fan of his. He's a neuroscientist out of Stanford. Listen to his podcast. Ridiculously useful information. But, you, you know, you got you to gotta learn in the small stakes conversations or you're not enhancing relationships and smoothing things out. You're leveling accusations. You're trying to get the other side to admit that they're guilty. And while it makes us feel good, look at the history of this sort of behavior. It doesn't actually do the world any good. Right. Shane, sorry, was I interrupting? No, I was going to say uh, it sounds like you um, you really have to open up vulnerable, which is a really hard thing to do, especially when someone when you feel like the like the person is basically against you. It's scary the first few times you try it. It is scary, and then suddenly, when you start seeing the effect that it has on other people, you're like, holy holy cow. <laughs> if I didn't know this was going to do this much good, I'd have started doing this a long time ago. But there's no models for it anyway. That you know, that's that's what I find really annoying because, you know, it's a rare skill, which means we're not going to see it that much in our personal life. And you know, what's our modeling for human behavior? Mostly, the entertainment industry and. The entertainment industry just gets it so long. Somebody makes an argument. Somebody makes an impassioned plea. And and the movies and the TV, it works. And the other side says, oh, thank God you pointed out what a horrible person I've been. I feel so much better. <laughs> it doesn't happen in real life. Chris, I brought someone else um, who who is on uh, the side of the Palestinians. Um, wait, no, wait, no, no, no. No? No? No, I'm on Israel's side, but I under but I can understand the Palestinian. Oh my God! Okay, someone someone messaged me and said uh, that you would take the other position, and I thought to to invite you up. My bad. No, it's but, okay. I mean, I can explain. I'm 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 Jewish and I'm pro Israel, but I I can understand the Palestinian perspective for sure. Take a well, shot at it. I want to hear interested. from her. In in hearing 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 what you have to say, go ahead. Is there a specific way you want me to frame this, or if I was just sympathizing with that perspective? Do I just lead in, just go right in? All right, so let's make the word empathizing, and let's 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 not make empathy and sympathy synonyms. How about that? Sure. Um, in empathizing with the Palestinians, they the Palestinian people are frustrated. They feel um, they feel displaced. Um, they feel threatened. They feel oppressed. Um, they feel frustrated because um, the Palestinians feel fr oppressed by the Israelis. They because um, a lot of them feel as though their grandparents are older than the state of Israel because they acknowledge Israel's creation to be in 1948. Um, right. So that's so to them with that with that logic, it's it's frustrating and it and it um, and it's painful. And they they believe that the Israelis are taking their land and pushing them out, and are putting their children in 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 the line of gunfire. And where there are, how do I say this without stating the other side? And they feel as though Hamas is the only or the only people who are going to protect them from that oppression and that displacement. Yeah, you are you are on the right track. And when you're stating it for the other side, you know, one of the rules we're teaching people in a black swan method, I mean, if you don't feel like you're laying it on thick, you're not laying it on thick enough. So were I to, to say it, because I got practice and only because I got practice and I and I seen the results, I, I'd say you're horrified at the way that your future is being destroyed you know, to, to say that the Israelis is the oppressor, oppressor, I mean, I, I, I would use a visceral 
physical description. You know, you, they've got their foot on your neck and they won't let you up. You feel that they're they're killing your children and they're treating you as if you're subhuman how, somehow. I mean, you, what you do when you overstate the negative for the other side, you actually relieve them. I mean, it's it, it clears it up. It doesn't reinforce it. It's the most effective way of reducing it that there is out there. Um, and nobody knows that until they've had the opportunity to to practice it and then find out how, what a relief it is for the other side. You know, the feeling of being understood is what opens people up to understanding the other side. And when people feel totally understood, they start to feel bonded to the person that demonstrated that understanding to them. It's a it's an oxytocin response. It's ridiculous. It's insane. They Stockholm. If you if you can remember the Stockholm syndrome, why do hostages protect the people that were threatening to kill them? Because there was an emotional event in the situation that they that they referred to before we had neuroscience as Stockholming, but there was an oxytocin bond that makes people bond in ways that defy logic and reason. And that's what demonstrating understanding and a couple of other things do. And it's it's the way forward. I mean, it's it's absolutely the way forward, in my view. Thanks, Chris. Um, this is a really uh, complex conflict, uh, an issue, and there's so many there's so many different factors to it and so much history on both sides. Um, and I would love, I, I thank you for everyone who came up. Uh, I would love to do this with uh, a Palestinian and an Israeli, um, you know, who, who, you know, who can represent Israel and Palestine, uh, in, in a format that's just dedicated to that, because I'm realizing this is, this is much more complex. Although I did, I did learn so much just listening, uh, listening to you and you all interact. Um, I wanted to throw it to Leah Lamar, who I know has a question uh, about this in particular. Leah, are you there? Hey, Nicole. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak. Chris, love hearing you as always. This room is fantastic, and it is very clear why this is the most popular room on Clubhouse right now. We are all learning and growing so much together. Thank you. I'm on the streets. Um, that's why there's a lot of noise. I apologize. Uh, my question to you, Chris, is so in this example, when we are trying to communicate between people that have an inclination toward Israel versus people have an inclination toward Palestine, I don't think that any of the people on stage want to kill each other, right? I think that all of these people just have strong feelings and want everyone to find peace. But how do you have these types of conversations between two people who want harm? How do you get to that place? And in those situations, how do you begin negotiations so that there is peace? All right, so I'll I'll answer that, and then we'll have to reset the room because it's getting heavy, and I'm gonna need another drink of bourbon before long. I'm getting I'm getting dehydrated. <laughs> and also, I don't know what you're Wait, wait another this. drink of bourbon. Wait, and, and yeah, Leah, how many are glasses you, are we on, Chris? Leah, are you out I, there? Are you doing? Are you doing that spin sign thing? Is that what you're doing out on the street? There's people that spin those arrow signs around. Is that what you're doing? Yeah. Like, come see my Club come see my show. Yes, and I'm begging anyone who will listen. So <laughs> there'll probably be one, negative one person at the show tonight. Thank you, Chris. Well, you, no. If 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 you're doing a show tonight, it's going to be a packed room. I mean, oh, you're the in. best. No, but but seriously, Chris, you know, it's like I love the way that you educate us. And I've learned so much, you know, the way that Bram is talking about using this for days. I'm like, hell, I'm going to start doing that. Thank God. Thank God for you. But I'm also like, how do we get Chris into the heart of the conflict? I feel like you can change the world. <laughs> That's how I really feel. And so when I hear you try to negotiate with both sides, I'm just like, but how do we get to the people who who are, in the, are violent or people who do it? How do we help them negotiate? How do we? Yeah, well, the, the, you know, the really hard problem is, you know, the marketing to gather supporters to your side. 
versus negotiating to come to an agreement with the other side of two vastly different skills. Like our political leaders on both sides, you know, there's, there's no side that's less guilty than the other, are great at drawing support and fundraising, preaching to the choir. But when it comes to talking to the other side, that, you know, they don't understand, well, you know, the people on my side, they loved hearing this. Why don't the people on the other side love hearing it, too? Those are two completely different skills. Like what you're asking me now, I mean, I'm an FBI. I was an FBI hostage negotiator. I'm a recovering hostage negotiator. You know, I haven't I haven't done hostage negotiations and like I could count the days like it's like being a recovering. It's like going to AA. What would NA uh, negotiators anonymous? That's what I'm part of hostage negotiators anonymous. But, you know, I got to start out by by taking a wild guess on how the other side's feeling. I am in the UAE. Uh, 10 years ago, I'm brought in to teach the UAE's hostage negotiation team. They sit me down with the sheikh, member of the royal family, who's in charge of terrorism. Cool guy. Interesting dude. Uh, went to school at Arizona State, got his master's degree at Georgetown, very Americanized Arab, uh, Emirati. Um, showed up with no entourage. I mean, and the guy came back and after he went to school, you know, he could have been an international playboy. They got all the money they need. He wanted to serve his government, want to serve his country. So they tell me in advance, this guy's the UAE. They got two serious concerns at the time. They're worried about Al Qaeda and they're worried about uh, the Iranians taking hostages in the UAE, killing people. And they tell me in advance, they say the sheikh understand the sheikh. If we have terrorists on our soil, the sheikh wants to kill them. If somebody's going to kill people on our soil, as a negotiator, he ain't interested in saving their lives. He's interested in saving Emirati lives. So you're going to need to get his attention right away. So I sit down with this guy, and he says, all right. And he pretty much says it like this because he's very Americanized. He says, what are you going to teach my people? You know, what's the first thing that you're going to teach my hostage negotiators to say to an Al Qaeda terrorist. And I said, what you're doing is a great thing. And his mouth fell open. And I said, and that's exactly the way the terrorist on the other side is going to react. Because right now you can't wait to hear what I'm going to say next. You're so stunned. I've completely got your attention. And I got you. And we got the job. <laughs> oh my god <laughs> Chris you are the master that's why we come here for the master class and can I just ask a very quick follow up question it's so tiny and so small my question is what do you think that we can do to extend an olive branch at this level Would, what, are there any ways that we can be helpful here now um, that feels palpable yeah, you know, uh, we can all do an awful lot just by demonstrating a respect for the other side's position. Respect is not agreement. Understanding is not agreement. Start showing how you can smooth things out. Refuse to engage in name calling. If if you feel a conversation on the issue going down the tubes. If you feel righteous indignation, if if you feel words that are going to that taste so good, if they just cross your lips, those words are not going to be helpful. Withdraw from the conversation. Say, you know, respectfully, I, I feel I'm losing my perspective and I want to do nothing but demonstrate respect for you and I'm going to withdraw. Our leaders on both sides love stirring us up on any political emotional issue because it, it gathers them followers and it gets them funding and people and when they're filled with righteous indignation donate there is no success model for conflict resolution anywhere that shows that you move people forward by name calling and the hurling of accusations and our you know our leaders by and large, I'm in Ramallah in 2008. 
I'm in Palestinian headquarters. I've been on both sides of the issue. And they were lamenting. They said to us, we're losing our faith in the leaders of both sides. And we're worried that nothing is going to progress for another eight years because it was the beginning of the Obama administration. And historically, American presidents do not want to wade into anything in international diplomacy till the second half of their second term. Trump broke that mold. He was happy to go into international politics from day one. And having broke that mold, I think that Joe Biden is following suit and he is wading in from day one. He's getting a lot of encouragement because of the additional conflict, but he was already wading in to foreign policy quickly and gently from the minute he took his oath of office. And I'm very encouraged by that. So we can show our leaders that we don't need to be inflamed in order to settle things out. And now we should reset the room. 